Uh, where are you off to next, then? Um, I, a... I'll go to Italy some later this week, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going back to a factory that makes this kind of, like, orthopedic gel for, for hospital beds. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're casting some... The, basically, they're, like, giant insects. It's yes! Welcome to the Art of Aperitif, happy hour conversations with artists to whet your creative appetite. I'm your host, Emily Vikra. Today's guest is Misha Khan. Misha is a visionary in the world of design and one of the leading creative voices of our generation, making boundary pushing irreverent and whimsical furnishings in a vast array of media ranging from cement to fine jewels. I caught up with him during a quick moment at home in New York between trips. Welcome to the show, Misha. He like got this alpaca slipper and he's just like, determined to shred it in the background <laughs> we can't get our dog any toys because she just like gets a toy and then starts meticulously you know shredding yeah, like, it yeah, taking yeah. the pieces apart she goes for the eyes first vicious yeah. they're vicious i guess that's their joy so yeah <laughs> can't deprive them of their joy um anyway thanks for taking the time to chat with me today um so i guess the biggest thing i want to talk with you about right because uh, like all my memories of you are playing with my younger brothers, uh, being the little brothers. Um, I feel like I have this my... intense memory of being at you guys' cabin and somebody caught a garter snake and got bit by it. I definitely was bit by a garter snake at some point, but I don't, I feel like, no, I think someone else must have gotten the, the mouth of the snake that time. I don't know how have, like, memories of you making mac and cheese for all of us and just, uh-huh. like, pouring the milk from, like, like getting on a stool to pour the milk from, like, many, many feet above the pot. Yeah, to get the perfect texture. Yeah, or, like, I don't know why. It just, like, make it very captivating. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. That's our background. <laughs> and uh, now here we are. I'm so just intrigued as to... How you be, how you went from Misha Khan catching garter snakes, eating mac and cheese, to Misha Khan design visionary. Um, were you like building things at Builders Commonwealth secretly all this time? We, <laughs> um, tell me the story. Well, I, I mean, I have abused the Builders Workshop sometimes. Um, and. I don't know. I mean, I, I was always making things, you know, like little, like around the house. And I would always have like a little studio in the basement and kind of make little miniature things and little miniature worlds. And it's, I feel like it's always kind of pathetic. You're like, well, I'm basically still doing that same thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like everyone, I feel like you see so many other people who are like, uh, now like, doing these like wildly different pursuits that you can even imagine as a kid. And somehow I'm like actually still just like crafting like miniature versions. And then the only difference is kind of figuring out how to manifest them and at, you know, human scale. Uh huh. That's Uh, not pathetic. I think it's like you were, you knew yourself from an early age. Let's take that narrative. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I'm like, maybe there's a lateral career move coming up. Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, so you've like always been fascinated kind of with world building and um, yeah. yeah. Is it, is it like, in a, tell me uh, more about that. Is it like an escapism? Are you uh, just envisioning a new different world or I think is it a control so, issue? To me, it feels like, um, I mean, I'm not interested in, I mean, I, I, I suppose it's kind of like making a movie or something like it's sort mm. of to make something that can kind of transport you so you feel sort of holistically inside of this kind of story and Mm -hmm. and, um obviously like you know my parents it's like funny because i feel like it's very like halfway between their two roles you know like one one kind of builds things and one kind of makes tells stories um and so i feel like and i think in a funny way without thinking about it that's kind of why my career worked because most people who design things are, are really building into like lots of, you know, trying to make a fancy looking house that looks, you know, a nice aspirational looking object that everyone can, um, 
can kind of glaze over and miss is like mm-hmm, usually mm-hmm. the goal. So then I think by not doing that, it was just so in your face that people know, you know, were like, I think people at first were, I feel like they were horrified for five years and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then they bought into it for five years. And now I feel like we're on to the next phase and we'll see what it is. Mm-hmm. That the, the, the next turn of the wheel of time yeah. to see people's reactions. Yeah. That's super funny, but it totally makes sense too, right? That kind of idea of fusing a bunch of your childhood influences or what you see, see around you. Um, are you still influenced by growing up in Duluth? I put a lot. Yeah. I mean, I, I love. You're in such a different world now. (laughs) That's true. It's true. I mean, it's changed a lot, but I think, I mean, I've definitely pulled a lot of little threads from Duluth to like use and work. Um, and I think it's kind of a good landscape. I mean, one of my first pieces that, that like got some attention was these pig benches mm-hmm. where I was making trees out of garbage and then just making pig benches out of them. Yeah. Like just, you do. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like we just, you know, have like a bunch of them kicking around our cabin. Um, and you know, I was just thinking about like, well, a pig bench like really is like this ultimate minimal object. Like it's just doing the least amount of work to a tree. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of like Minnesota pragmatism that is kind of haphazardly very artistic and pure um, mm-hmm. without going through mental cartwheels or something. It's just like, just honest. Um, and so I feel like I keep pulling those kinds of threads out and I also think it's kind of a nice like there's a sort of garage MacGyver culture (laughs) that yes kind of like excuses things like looking a certain way if you can just like get it done um that is 100% my family (laughs) (laughs) it it works I shook it it works it's kind of the opposite of I mean Arno's my my dad's like obviously the polar opposite of that so Mm -hmm. then I think I would see it in other and other qualities and be like find it very exotic that like mm-hmm, they could mm-hmm. just like slam something together and like my grandpa was like this like there was these sort of pulley systems with like ropes and and pulleys to like open up all these different parts of the cabin <laughs> <laughs> um and i feel like that kind of aesthetic value is something i keep kind of using mm-hmm. yeah I, it's like it seems like it would be a nice or it might be what kind of gives your pieces that like a grounded feeling, even though they're so whimsical and explosive and colorful and things like that, there's kind of this fundamental utility to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that what draws you to making furniture and functional objects? Cause like there's so much that you create that and it could be just pure art and is like fluffy and poofy and colorful and wending and whatnot but then at the end of the day it's also like a functional object i don't yeah i mean i think that i sort of always saw it as like a way to excuse the uh, as excuse the thing <laughs> yeah not, you know like people like when you see something as a as a chair you're like oh that's like well, that's a wild chair um and then if you take away the function you're just asking people to sort of just look at its sculptural qualities, which is great. But I think I always felt like I could move further with mm-hmm. the functional thing because then you're not ma- then you're not like um, caught up in in like the why is that why is that like that um, <laughs> yeah. part of the part of the thing, and especially for sculpture, I think making three D objects in an art context is really weird because most people don't buy sculptures for domestic spaces you know like a big collector will buy some but not it's kind of a limited category so it ends up always being these sort of like institutionally scaled things or kind Mm. of small things um and i just kind of love this the human it's nice to work at like a human scale like you're like okay like i can get my hands in there and like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you can wrap your arms around it. Yeah. Yeah, I can move this. I can, like, I can finish this this year. It's not going to, like, mm-hmm. take 10 years. 
So I think for a lot of reasons, it just ended up being like a nice, like sliver. But now I'm kind of making some stuff that's more purely sculpture,、mm. um, and some more like we're we're working on some architecturally scaled projects, which has been exciting to do some really huge outdoor things. So it's kind of we'll see where it goes. Yeah, follow follow the thread. Yeah, see where it goes. Um. You use so many different materials too, like plastic, resin, fibers, glass, metal,、um, and there's like such a strong sense of materiality to everything I see. Although I see it all through the internet, so, but it, even、yeah. even through the internet, it gives that sense of like physical presence.、Um, how have you learned to work with all these materials, and like what draws you to using so many different things?、Mm. Well, I mean, it's probably just like my ADD. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people、yeah. are so happy to like just like sit with one thing and like work on a certain process. But it's it's so nice to kind of get to use all these different things, and they each have different you know qualities.、Um, and also, it makes the my day so much more exciting because like a lot of the my time is like visiting places and working with people who do metal casting or weaving.、Mm-hmm. Or, Now we're doing a bunch of embroidery and、um, the tapestries and all these different elements, and it's so fun to kind of visit all these different artisans and get to see how they do things and like learn all of the possibilities. And so it feels like you're traveling at kind of warp speed、mm. in the studio when you're doing it. There's you learn so much just by like trial and error and messing something up and seeing a new possibility.、Um, and I feel like I've gotten really good at. Asking the questions of these people to like find out all of like as many possibilities as I can of like、mm-hmm. where some you know like ways in which you could work with the material that that maybe they wouldn't normally do, but you could you could kind of come at it from a new way,、um, and and kind of bringing in like projects or ideas that let people do that,、mm-hmm. and. It also becomes like a cookie crumb trail. Like, I'm working with this jeweler in in Italy, and he's like, "I need to introduce you to some people." And so then, like, we're driving around and meeting other people, you know, like other skills that I've I've kind of never even thought to use. And so then, all of a sudden, you're like adding more pe- more materials and things to this like、mm-hmm. growing web.、Um, yeah, I feel like my next job is trying to like. Tone it down a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> to pull back again. Yeah.、Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll see it. Yeah. There's like, I think we're all in the world right now dealing with how to balance the like maximalism of having so much available to us, so much information, so many visuals, so many materials, like everything from history all the time, and there's an excitement to that, but there's also like. Potential for boredom because you're like, well, not everything's everything, and we're putting everything into everything. And how do I, how do I make meaning,、um, yeah, in the midst of that chaos? No, I agree. I mean, I think that so much of the aesthetic, like so much of the sort of formal qualities, have always been like driven by that. Like you're in one、mm-hmm. space, but you're seeing images on your phone, and you're talking to someone else. Like, like the, this, the level of stimuli and variety is so extreme that. I always felt like our objects should be at that level,、mm-hmm. otherwise it was like it feels unnatural.、Um, but I think we always also have the fantasy of like removing ourselves from that,、mm-hmm. and、yeah. so there's like a huge romance when things, you know, like if you go to a cabin and all the furniture is super simple,、um, that there's something really like lovely and romantic about that also. So.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they. I think they both have a really、um, nice pull.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it's cool that you work with so many like traditional artisanal techniques, but treat them in a new, less precious way. It feels like that's something that you're motivated by. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's interesting. I feel like we're losing so much craft. So.、Mm-hmm. And so, 
I generally approach it with a like, let's try and make this as lo-fi and clunky as possible mm. mm-hmm. within the genre of like still like really admiring what the craft is. Um, because I do think it like, I don't know. I mean, it's not, a, I guess it's not really a preservation goal, but just as like a way to sort of keep it going. It's like, oh, this should be sort of at the level that someone could watch a YouTube tutorial. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like learn to do it. Gets back to kind of the Minnesota MacGyver yeah, thing yeah, too, definitely. right? There's this like drive to over specialize in our society. And while that's like cool, cause you can exist in an ecosystem with each other, doing very different things that support each other. You also like really lose something when you don't have that window into how, how things are made. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like so much of it, I mean, you know, like all of the, all of those kinds of crafts, if there's not like value in it to become, they just like lose their desirability. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a, a weird like relationship to trends, but then it's like, but this is something we've done for thousands of years. And now it's kind of fading. Yes. Um, right. Because it got trendy and then it fades or yeah. Yeah. It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I like to grapple with because I mean, I have a distillery. I work in the cocktail sphere it can be very trend driven. And yeah, I'm always grappling with the, like there, <laughs> how, how do you deal with the fact that like things that are delicious come and go Yeah. Um, when delicious is delicious. And it's really true. And like, it, I guess it is exactly the same because it, it's all just about like saturation or something like what a thing is probably emphatically that, but then mm-hmm. if you have, you know, that tastes like too many different places because everyone's asking for it and that's what, and that's what they want. And how do you not do that? Um, but then they get sick of it because mm-hmm. that's like what people do. Yes. Right. <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting cycle. Well, I'm sure it's kind of, I mean, I feel like your lifespan of making a new product also has to be, um, slow, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I imagine you have to be a couple of years out from a new thing. So it's also like, you have to just intuit where you believe people are going to get to. Yes. Um, Right. Or like make something that you believe in enough that then when you release it, you're impassioned enough to try to convince people that they should, you know, really (laughs) like it, which I spent, you know, 10 years doing with Akavit. Um, how is it? I feel like like it's panning out. I feel like it's panning out. I feel like it's panning out more often. Now people are like, I would like to try your Akavit instead of what is Akavit. But I would still say like 50% of people are like, what is (laughs) Akavit? Why would I drink this? (laughs) It keeps showing up on cocktails here in New York. So I don't know what that means for you, but it's getting there. It's getting there. I, uh, <laughs> does it go on the boat journey? It does not go on the boat journey. Okay, this okay. is a, I don't know, if that, I know. Was, if that was all, um, farce anyways. Uh, it is not farce, but it's just like a particular style of Akavit okay. has to go on the boat. Not all Akavit goes on the boat, but also we have, uh, our friendly federal regulators known as the TTB who don't really like you to send things traveling around. <laughs> The Norwegians must be a little bit more lax about that sort of thing. Because yeah, like, we, we were, like, trying to get Akavit on a boat to, like, at least go to Wisconsin. No. Um, yeah, yeah. No. No dice. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I guess it's, like, they're, like, well, how clean is the boat? We're going to need to see the boat. <laughs> exactly. We're going to need to see the boat. We're going to have to make it into bonded space. It's going to have to have this type of padlocks on it. No. Uh, that haven't been manufactured since 1987. That sort of thing. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. A whole new set of struggles. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, I'm intrigued then as to how uh, you think about technology in art and craft and all of that. I feel like most of the people who I've been talking to about creativity and artistry and all of that stuff um, use their art often to like push back against technology and rehumanize in the face of kind of dehumanizing influences, which it seems like you're very aware of, but I know you also use a lot of technology and are interested in virtual reality and things like that. I'd love to hear how you're thinking about it these days. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I have two robots now and like 
16 3D printers, and there's really, like, <laughs> um, I think, and there's a, there is some kind of tech pursuit also. I think we're kind of, like, successfully building one of the world's largest resin printers now, which mm-hmm. like basically pulls objects out of, like, a huge vat of... of That's liquid. so cool. That's pretty cool. Um, and it's funny to... But I, to me, that part seems really important because I think that that pushback against technology, which I understand all of the like impetus for, doesn't mean it means that like you as an artist are just like removing yourself from the conversation about like what, what how we want to like visualize the future, because like mm-hmm. there's always an option to like romanticize doing things in a simpler way or the way that the past was done. And I think we just keep visualizing this future that like AI replaces humans and Mm -hmm. things are autonomous. Like humans are the robots win. (laughs) Yeah. Like we keep imagining this future where like humans are kind of unnecessary. Um, And so I'm always trying to use tech in a way that's super collaborative with humans. So it's just like this one of the tools and it gets worked in with all these hand techniques and takes on these really, um, I don't know, narrative qualities, I guess, as a way to sort of imagine like how this feature pans out that's super, I don't know, incorporates a lot of natural elements and like humans are really collaborative with machines. And it feels like it's also made my studio kind of look like we're on one of the rebel planets of Star Wars. Like, uh-huh. everything's, like, so scrappy, even though it's, like, there's, like, really high-tech components, but then, like, everything's, like, cobbled together. Um, there's still a lot of duct tape, you know, like... And, it's almost the only thing you need most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think that that's been kind of interesting to sort, to sort of pursue that, and... It kind of surprised, I mean, some of it too is I'm not naturally a, a computer person. So mm-hmm. it's been, it always feels like edgy or, or like I'm always kind of shocked when something works. So I think it like <laughs> gives a nice feedback. You know, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. it's like so fun to be surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think going forward, my, I, I just want to keep, I want to make the work like more and more integrated with like stuff that's super hand, handmade and, um, you know, uses these kind of ancient techniques with these really, you know, with the sort of tech developments that keep, keep coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. It's, I'm, I'm glad people like you are envisioning a future where it's not either or. Yeah. <laughs> um, cause I definitely, you know, feel in myself that push to be like, I'm going to romanticize the past and we didn't have any of this stuff and, uh, discard all of it while also knowing fundamentally that a, the past was not that great either. And, um, yeah, the, the yeah, only yeah. way forward is forward and it's, it's, uh, yeah, a lack of imagination when you can't say, how can we use these things as tools, the tools that they are in a collaborative and actually like more human way. Yeah. Well, I think as soon as creative people aren't using things, then you're like, you're really giving it over to the, you know, the The basic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's very true. That's very true to just like make it. Yeah. Nothing but a tool to like maximize wealth for certain people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. Tell me, do you have any like creative practices or things you do to like seek out inspiration? I mean, you said meeting all these different artisans, which seems like it could be an endless source of inspiration. No, I, I, it's so not formulaic, which sometimes I Mm -hmm. think is problematic, but, um, you know, like I'll meet an artist who's like, well, I go for like, you know, an hour long walk through the woods every morning or like something like that. That's. Yeah. That's like so focused. Like, I like, journal oh every God. day like, for 15 minutes. No, mine's really erratic. Um, I mean, I love traveling and I think that's been a big part of, of like kind of finding inspiration and then like bringing something back and trying to be focused on it in the studio. So, um, but no, I feel like my, my 
my day is like sort of waking up and then like dilly dallying until I'm so filled with stress and anxiety about things I have to get done that I'm like get to the studio and work with this sort of feverish panic. Uh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I live like this? Yeah, yeah. How do I do this to myself? Um, but yeah, sometimes panic is the great source of creativity right there. It's true. I mean, I think if you, I think doing things slowly is horrible. <laughs> you know, I think like working, like I always feel like I'm, I'm at my best when we're like trying to do so many things. You're like, yeah, like it's this, it's this, it's this. Um, and as soon as you're kind of, it like crystallizes in, things. Yeah. Yeah. You just kind of make like a quick and efficient decision. That's like the, the best one rather than like, I don't know. I feel like when I see a piece where I knew I like ended up having all this time and like second guessing myself and mm. doing parts, you're like, it looks more figured out, but it kind of lost. It's like the energy. Mm -hmm. I like more figured out, but lost some of the intuitive qualities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to ask, cause to me, so many of your pieces look, I don't know, kind of like blown up versions of like intracellular objects did you uh, do you draw on like biology and microscopic universes to create these bigger universes i i i wasn't really <laughs> like that it was just like you know i mean i think what's interesting is adding a vr component is there's so much stuff that's structured in there that's about like how to build thing and mm -hmm. like, clearly like those construction choices are like essentially just a shitty version of biology <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I think like being right. inspired by all of these things was like this like really roundabout way to to realize that I was like doing something that related to it. So for mm -hmm. a project I'm working on right now, I ended up I was making all these shapes and then like started looking at diagrams of like the inside of bugs, like how their sort of or organ structures work. Yeah, and it was like all of the shapes we were making. <laughs> But then, like, there was new, you know, there was, like, amazing, like, better shapes or, like, interactions I hadn't thought about. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think those things have become a really good way to sort of push it, where where a certain part was intuitive, but now I'm kind of adding in um, some inspiration from from more, like, yeah, science and nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's, it's fun because there are certain like there are patterns in nature that are repeated at different scales but they tend to be more like branching patterns and crystalline patterns and less of the like loopy poofy patterns that yeah. max out at a certain size so it's like cool to <laughs> to blow up the poofs yeah yeah well i'm like it's nice to be able to work in a way where there's like no fidelity to anything else. Mm -hmm. well yeah this shape was kind of good but like let's move it over there and do this whole other thing with it um yeah, so nothing's, you're not tethered to much. Mm hmm Um, okay. Back to uh, cocktails for a hot minute, just to like, I don't know, pretend to tie things together. Do you, uh, do you and Nick like to entertain? And do you have a favorite pre-dinner drink? We are bad entertainers because I am... <laughs> extremely messy and nick is very clean so he never wants anyone to come over to the house mm -hmm. because i'm part of probably he would entertain him when i was gone for a month <laughs> um but i do i like i like to and i love a pre-dinner drink um wow it just really depends on i feel like they all have locations when i'm in manhattan mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. well i will just have a dirty gin martini I'm like that's mm -hmm. the, the perfect thing but um, then you go to Italy, and I just want to chin our spritz. So um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like every drink is fair game. It's a bad answer. It's not. I would I would totally agree with that. I know people always ask me about my favorites, and I'm like, it's completely situational. And I know that sounds like being a dodgy politician, but it is. That's part of the joy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems kind of sad to have a re like to just have one regular because mm -hmm. you kind of like you know keep having variety. Mm -hmm. Try new things, explore new flavors. Is there a new is there a new cocktail on the list? Oh, there's always new cocktails. Um, my current favorite cocktail that we're making at our bar 
is one that I designed that has like a blueberry and sherry infusion. So there's like fruit in it, but there's no sweetness because the Ooh. sherry is very like nutty and saline. Um, and then we have that with gin and a little bit of Amaro and Americano, which is kind of a version of vermouth. Um, so it has like some roots in a Negroni, but it's very different from a Negroni. And then I'm dashing some uh, olive juice as well to like elevate the salinity of the sherry. This sounds um, great. In I contrast want, with the blueberry. I, I'm I like always it. just wanting like the briniest cocktail I can possibly mm-hmm. have. Yeah. Salt. <laughs> sea. All that good stuff. <laughs> I know. We've been like, I know it's old news, but we've been spherifying things lately. And it's like, if you spherify squid ink to have on the side of a martini, Ooh. that's really fun. Cool. What does it mean? <laughs> like a little frozen ball of squid ink? It's like a little gelatinized ball. I think it uses uh, agar maybe and okay. oils and it like makes little globules. <laughs> wow, a boat like a boba. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like DIY boba. Yeah, cool. It is. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to think too about, uh, well, and this is something interesting with like furniture and design and art. And thinking about how do you push things while maintaining some element of practicality because I'm trying to, <laughs> my current drink experiment is trying to put cocktails inside of eggs um, that I reseal with like a food safe glue and then paint the egg, but then you have to crack the egg into a glass, um, but it's not scalable. Yeah, but it sounds nice. Yeah. I feel like it's got to be scalable. Maybe it's just about the right kind of egg packaging. Maybe. Yeah. Right now, like, you're piercing and blowing out all the eggs and and then feeding them to my kids for breakfast. Like, hatching, (laughs) like, put it, like, in a little tiny hole, Mm -hmm. getting out the Mm -hmm. bondo. Mm hmm. Yep. So maybe there's a way to scale it. I would drink that. Any, anything else? Any fun? Things that you're particularly excited about on the horizon right now? You said some of the architectural scale things. Yeah. No, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm at like a nice point of time starting on all new stuff, and it's very exciting. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of nice to enter a new thing and be like, okay, can I treat this as lawlessly as I've treated all these other things? I'm like, mm-hmm. will this pan out? Or, like, is this the time that I'm just making a huge mess. Um, So I'm just in like a funny state of trying to work through all these, these things. And hopefully in a year, there's something to show for it. Mm -hmm. I imagine it'd be like, if you were like, let's just take one of the vats and like throw a bunch of shit in and see what happens. See what happens. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you struggle with anxiety about approaching things that way? That's something I'm always kind of trying to, balance because it's like i want to do the experiments but then when it's a business you're like the room for error is smaller it's really cruel because it's the greatest hits of of the the parts that have been received the best and been the biggest like financial hits were things that were like total crapshoot experiments Mm. so you see the reward from it because like it's the only way to get to something that's like really new. Um, but then at the same time, like there's so many failures. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, Oh, I'm spending so much time and money, like working on these things. So I have a, yeah, I have tons of anxiety about it because mm. you always kind of are going into these things a little bit blind and yeah. And then like a year goes by and you've like done all this stuff. And you're like, Oh shit. We've like, yeah, this isn't useful or what, what have I done? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to, like, get, I'm, I, I, if I could, like, find a way to remove all the anxiety, it would probably be mm. useful, but um, I guess it's part of it. Mm-hmm. All right, it's part of, it's probably part of growing as a human. Yeah. There's our wisdom. That's, <laughs> that's all we've you got. Were, that's you were part. just, you were just wise by accident. I feel like that's what cocktails <laughs> are for. That's where you... <laughs> Yeah, deal with the anxiety. It's always like the part of the day where you're like, okay, I'm done with that. And now I'm like, yeah, on to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Sit down, decompress. Well, that is, yeah, that's one of the things I love about a pre-dinner cocktail ritual 
ritual ritual um is that like purposeful transition and letting go of one phase of the day is day and you know entering into the next yeah no really I really consciously agree. it's like it like formalizes it You're like okay, mm-hmm. that was chaotic and now <laughs> something different yes and now something entirely different awesome well what else are you up to on your sunday um i don't know probably i on me probably wants to go to the park and nick is flying to rome in a few hours so i feel like we'll go wander around and yeah have a lazy sunday nice yeah my family's currently out my family's currently out uh choosing a christmas tree oh. i was like you must leave the house i have two boys i know i know um, yeah and they are very loud um, How? So I was like leave <laughs> I guess I saw them as sort of toddlers in the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And then you realize that like two years at that age, just like a lot of change. Like everyone. Yeah. Else right. They can double in but... size. Yeah. yeah. So they just turned nine and just turned five. Oh shit. Yeah. They're huge now. Oh my God. It's sassy. No. Yeah. Yeah. They're better when they can only sort of talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And everything that comes out of their mouth is cute. Yeah. Well, I guess you were equipped for having two rowdy boys. It's like it, was, lot in life. it was fate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> my lot in life to always be surrounded by rowdy boys who are like nerf gunning and super soakering everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems cruel. Yeah. The universe could have given you something different. No. Nope. No dice. Well, thanks for hanging out and chatting with me. Yeah, well, hopefully I'll see you over the, well, I'll, I'll swing down over the holidays and hopefully catch you. Excellent. That would be super fun.